Hello and welcome. My name is Lena and I'm very excited to be sitting here, virtually at least, um, sharing a coffee with Candice Carty Williams, who is the author of Queenie. Queenie won some pretty big awards um, on Monday night. So I'm really excited to talk to her about her incredible debut novel. Um, here she is. Are you there? <gasps> Candice hey. Carty. So I would I would have made a cup of tea. I didn't know it was like a thing. Oh, I'm but sorry. Here you go. Yes, I've actually made two. Here you go. One for me. One for you. Thank you. <laughs> the virtual one. Um, how are you, Candice? How does it feel? It feels amazing. I feel pretty like bewildered. Um, still. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of a mad thing, and my phone is going crazy. But it's nice. I mean, I can't complain. Um, but yeah, it's just nice. I just feel. It will probably kick in properly in like a week, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like a lot of people are hitting these huge like life milestones while their actual interior life stays very similar. <laughs> so it feels strange to not be able to have a drink with you and, and, and celebrate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I just wanted to chat to you about so much. I've got so many questions. I wonder how many we'll be able to get in because obviously, you know, I'm a fan of Queenie um, and I think your career is incredible um, so far and I can't wait to hear where you're going next. Um, tell us a little bit about the publication process of Queenie. Um, you obviously kind of started writing it when you were about 20, tw 25, 26. Yeah. Um, and um, and it's kind, of, it's kind of been a bit of a whirlwind since then. Do you think your head's caught up with it? Do you can you comprehend um, the kind of way your life's changed and and the way the book's been out there in the world now? No, I don't think it has. So like when a friend of mine, I met up with her to talk about just like what had been going on a few years ago, and when I was like describing what happened, so I was like, so yeah, I wrote this novel and. I submitted it to an agent and then you know, there was like four publishers who wanted to get involved in it and then I chose this one it's being published and she was like oh it's weird because you're talking about it like um someone else and I was like oh that's a bit weird and I think I still do that sometimes um just because it's quite a bizarre thing that I guess you just don't learn when you're writing you're just kind of like oh it was just like be fun and exciting and then actually just loads more comes with it um but yeah no I, I i'm yet to catch up with it i'm gonna give my every year i give myself like a, i'm like next year you'll be fine and then the next year i'm like it's still really weird. so it's just really weird yeah well that's the problem with being talented more more like amazing stuff happens to you and you've always got work to do to catch up with your own brain <laughs> you made yourself yeah. a problem there <laughs> um one of the um, things you talk about when you talk about uh, why you started writing the book was because you saw this kind of gap on the shelf that you're like I'm not really seeing myself like through YA and through children's books it's kind of easier to find yourself and then you got to this age where you're like I don't see myself and I, I think mm -hmm. there's like a Tony Morrison quote about that isn't that about writing writing what you want to read how does it yeah. feel to have written that and and get to meet those readers who now don't have as much of a gap on their shelves I mean, it's amazing because ironically, I, I have never been able to look at Queenie again. Um, I'm adapting it for the TV, which was meant to be a secret, um, but it's not. And um, everyone was like, you should reread it. And I'm like, no, I can't do that. Um, so as much as I would like to see myself, I, I don't want to do that. Um, but it feels like the readers, it, it's amazing to me. I saw a message even a couple of days ago that made me cry. It was someone who was like, oh, because of... Um, your book, it gave me the courage to go to therapy. And I was like, oh, that's like all I've ever wanted. So for me, it's about like, I guess I wanted to talk about the year in a life of this girl. And then I wanted to show in it that like courage does not come from being strong and overcoming everything, but it just comes from kind of accepting your stuff. Um, and so I hope that that's what I've done for lots of people. And I feel like that's what I've done because lots of people tell me that. So I have to believe them. <laughs> you must you must um i was interested to ask you about these um kind of like i feel like there's two camps of readers online uh people who like agree with this comparison this kind of like trope now being like oh it's a black bridget jones and then other people who are like mm, it's not really that for all of these reasons and i felt that as well like reading it i was like okay she's also a girl living in london in her 20s but it's also mm. a very kind of different thing as well do you think there's also uh, some of comparisons I was thinking about was how like politicized uh Queenie is and how much that's discussed and how she goes to Black Lives Matter protests and she is a very like 
active person in a way that Bridget Jones really wasn't a great example for that, <laughs> to be honest. Um, yeah. Do you think, like, it's like, is is Queenie like a kind of a, like an evolution of the idea of Bridget Jones in our heads of of what it means to be a young woman, or or is like comparing it to Bridget Jones kind of like an attempt to depoliticize Queenie and make it like, do you know what I mean? Not what it is. How do you feel about no. that comparison? Well, it was very much, it was one that I made because I was like, because I'm quite demanding. So I was like, I would like commercial success for this. I don't want this to be published in a small way. And so likening it to uh, Bridget Jones was like, that's the kind of standards that we want. And that, that's who we want to be talking to, like all of those people and beyond. Um, and so I know that she could never be Bridget Jones just because if you think about the fact that like Queenie could just never, ever have the the life of a white woman she just never could because there is so much politically that goes on with her her body is politicized her mind is politicized her work is politicized. so everything that's going on around her it just i mean the point the whole point of it was that like you know as much as we're living the same kind of life there are such stark differences because it's just not as easy so it was a kind of it was just, as you said, maybe an evolution, but also just like an, an extension of that, and also just like a different iteration of a life that someone is. Tr someone is. She's trying to live like a sort of simple life. She's trying to just have like a boyfriend and a house, and like have her mental health be okay. But there is too much going on in her life to allow that to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's also interesting, I think, because. Um, I saw a comment online that somebody was like, Queenie's different from Bridget Jones because she actually does something about it. <laughs> she's kind of like a bit of a mess, but she's like, then she gets a therapist. <laughs> and she yeah. kind of... That's too. Like, because if she doesn't, like what will happen? Like she's literally like having a nervous breakdown. So she's like, there is no way that this can go on, you know? So yeah, Bridget is just like, yeah, Bridget's Bridget stuff is kind of low key, you know? But you know, it's all relative. But yeah, that stuff is, is not as intense. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a part in it I really liked when she's kind of like ranting to her therapist and her therapist is like, I think you need to think beyond this. And, and she says, I'm not quoting directly, obviously, but like she says something like, I can't walk away from this body. I can't walk away. I'm not choosing to represent people. I just do because that's who I, like I can't get out of it. Um, you like kind of um, touring the book and representing the book and kind of going around the world talking about this book. How do you feel about people equating you with Queenie has that been is that in some way accurate is that a problem is that something that like it must be an interesting like author dynamic to be traveling with Queenie but not be Queenie it's a really weird also that quote was almost spot on so well done um but it's a really weird thing where I don't like to so I don't I rarely read from the book because I'm like if I do that will invite the comparison and people will be like, oh, she's basically just reading her diary, um, which is annoying because Queenie gets up to a lot of stuff that I, I would not dream of. I can only imagine and fictionalise. Um, and so, yeah, that's been quite hard. So I think I kind of like having to do a disclaimer and be like, so just, hi, so I'm not Queenie, you know, just like, and when anyone says like, what question do you get asked the most? I'm always like, am oh, my Queenie is the question that I get asked the most. And I have to say every single time, that is not me. But as soon as I've got that out of the way, it's been really nice to connect with people and talk to people. And I think like there's a lot of vulnerability on show when I talk to people um, that come to events. And so like I do the event and then, you know, there are some questions, which is like kind of like sometimes like the practicality of writing and like, how do you feel about these things? But then it's in the signing queue that people are like this really intense thing happened to me. And I'm just really grateful to have read that it happened to Queenie as well, because it made me feel less alone. And so that is like the most important thing to me. So, I mean, like being compared to Queenie is not like the worst thing in the world, but it's still like, my God, I'm so boring. I'm so boring. I am so boring in comparison, you know? <laughs> I don't think so at all. <laughs> um, I think as well, like this kind of um, talking about mental health, because obviously, yeah, that's the problem is that you bring yourself to your writing, but then when you have events, like the readers are bringing themselves as well and their real story, so that makes sense. Um, how did you, um, did you consciously go uh, into the book being like, I want to talk about mental health with this book, I want that to feature like prevalently, or was that just something that came with the character of Queenie and, and it's like, you couldn't divorce one from the other? Was that an intention or was it just something that happened? 
So I kind of had an idea. I, d- I definitely had an idea of what I wanted to say. And I had a character in my head. So I always start with my characters first and foremost, uh, rather than just being like themes, topics. Um, but I definitely knew that she would encounter this because I was thinking about just like the life of the the life of, of the life that someone like her would lead, basically. And I know that just like living in this world and inhabiting a similar body to Queenie and being in similar spaces, the toll on your mental health is insane. Like it's really, really bizarre. And you know, you're taught to be strong from a young age. And then as you grow up, this thing happens where people just then assume strength for you. And so think that you can just handle everything and weather everything. And you're kind of weirdly trying to hold on to that and being like, no, 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 I can, I can cope with everything. And so you can't. And it was about someone almost in real time, just like, there's the quote, a quote from the book that I think we used somewhere. It was about her like holding on to all of these balls of wool and then like one falls and she goes to like catch it and she drops another two and then like she goes to catch those and then three fall. And it's that, it's that thing where like your life is like doing all of these things and you're trying to keep up with yourself and be strong and hold on to everything. But it's just unrealistic. And so the, you know, everyone has like mental health issues, but there's definitely stigma about it in black communities, um, which I've understood and experienced. Um, and I really wanted to show that it's important. And so that's why when I say that someone messaged me and said, you know, Queenie meant that I could go and like seek therapy. I was so happy because I was like, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. And it all goes back to this idea of loneliness and me wanting people to feel a lot less lonely in the lives that they live where they're trying to be strong and they're trying to hold on to things. And they have this idea of themselves that they can just like deal with everything, but that's massively unrealistic. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think as well, like part of that was the um, like featuring that female friendship group, the the Corgis, for anyone who hasn't read it, they're called the Corgis because she's called Queenie and I enjoy that joke. <laughs> um, th- I think part of it for me, what was like so realistic and, and something that I realised that I hadn't read anywhere else was that like the WhatsApp group was held up as like a sacred space. <laughs> and was like properly portrayed because I feel like the whatsapp group like the the girls whatsapp group is now like is the new like getting drunk in the toilets and like talking in the toilets kind of thing it's like um so I loved like how prevalent that was and also you talk about how um like all of the men in it only have three letter names because they're just kind of like and they don't really have like huge backstories or anything because it's not about them um tell me yeah (laughs) um tell me a little bit about um how that came to pass and and like how you how you managed to form all those characters are they based on real people and also just like how did I think I don't I guess I'm just paying you a compliment here but I just think that like that friendship group was portrayed so realistically and it also being kind of into it was a, a, a friendship that's interracial it's into class like it like how did you go about forming that friendship group in your head well I just thought about the fact that like I have such a I have a, a I have friends from so many different backgrounds so it felt really bizarre for me to have written a story about a young black woman who just had black friends because I don't just have black friends um and that would be a very it just wouldn't I think just in the environment that I grew up in that would just be kind of unrealistic and, and that wouldn't happen um and so Cheska is literally my one of my best friends Isabel um she is based on her and I had to Cheska is actually her Ugandan name and I had to ask permission from her um family if I could use that name um and they said yes and they're all very proud of me which is nice um and so that is the date story in the book is a date that my friend Isabel actually went on and I remember her telling me about it and I thought I was going to die because I was laughing so much and I remember just thinking like, I know all of these amazing people and so like I just it kind of feels weird to just like have access to them for myself when I know that they're so good and so funny and I don't see them on tv and I don't see them in books and it was like what the why that doesn't make sense I'm seeing like so many of the same types of people on tv all the time um and so that is like one person and then Cassandra and Darcy are kind of a mix of like a few friends um but Cassandra is no real friend that I know because Cassandra is obviously a terrible person but has her uses but is also not a great person um, <laughs> you and then, huh you wouldn't keep her around <laughs> no not oh my god no um but the idea 
them all coming together to kind of support Queenie was important because um, they all come from different backgrounds and they can all shine a light on some way in what Queenie's going through. And they can all have like their voice and their understanding. And it was when I sort of could hear them talking to each other in my head that I was like, yeah, no, no, this feels that this feels like very solid and very real, just because you do have that. And I think, you know, like I'm very lucky to have loads of different friends. I have, you know, Queenie has her like three key friends. I have like 300 key friends. Um, so trying to distill those into that, but also knowing that when things go wrong, I immediately turn to my friends and I'm like, what, do, please help me, tell me what to do. Um, and we just all do that. We all kind of need that. We can't just do things on our own. And so it was important to me that she had those friendships and she could kind of deal with that first before she actually sought professional help. <laughs> Definitely. And I think it's interesting as well, because it's that's kind of like quite more of a millennial experience because so like, compared to like our parents' generation, we settle down later and actually our, our friends in our twenties are our family. Um, yeah. So I think that's, it was just really realistic. Um, kind of like thinking about like all of the stuff that's covered in the book, it must be hard to like have to talk about that and think about it all the time. Is like the way, the way that's portrayed, like a lot of people might think that some of it's like shocking or some of it's like quite upsetting, but it's also really what happens to like women in their twenties. It's a real thing. Um, how did you like decide how far to go with, with that? And like what you put in the book, like how, how much you explained of that and, sh and kind of, I don't know how descriptive you are about that kind of stuff. Cause it's also obviously shocking, but obviously there's a lot of like younger people that'll be reading it. Like, did you take stuff out or did you, write stuff and realize you were self-censoring and put more in like which which way around was it no i put a lot more in my editor was like oh my god take some of the sex out and i was like do we have to do that and she was like yeah because it just gets a bit gratuitous and i was like okay fine fair enough uh she was right though um because there's still a lot in it now um but i think it was yeah i think it was important for me to show that and i didn't really so i always say because i'm 30 now if i'd written that when i if I'd written Queenie now, I think it'd be very different because I think I just had a bit more courage and I had a bit more vim and a bit more sort of like, I was like more like, you know, I was like ready to like say stuff and like I was like really brave. And also I didn't know who'd be reading it. And I was like, oh, maybe like a few people read this or maybe no one read it at all. So I think I could just like be, be bold enough to be like, this happened and that happens. Because I, when I hear some of the things that people say back to me, I'm like, oh my God, did I really write that? That is... That was quite something. Um, so while I don't have any regrets, I think I would just do things like, I think I'd probably do things a bit differently now. But I think it's important that it is what it is though. But yeah, as I say, I will never go back and read it. And if someone was like, you know, maybe you could go back and like, edit it one more time, I'd be like, no, I can't, because I would just probably take half of it out. Yeah. <laughs> the censorship of old age. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Prove now. Um, I heard your really great um, interview on Women's Hour about um, the the kind of strange feeling of, of conversations around diversity happening at the moment as the result of somebody's death. And I think that's really, it's a really hard thing to get your head around. And I think there's obviously lots of conversations at the moment in the publishing industry um, about it. And I think that I really hope those carry on and it's not another moment that we have and then we forget. Um, mm -hmm. Is there like, is there anything that you'd want to like say to people who are coming up in publishing or people who are in those positions right now? Um, and, and also kind of is in 2030, what would a good like publishing industry look like? Do you have hope for it? And what would that like, what would that be like? Cause I kind of like, I try and come at it from a thing of like, okay, what's the ideal situation in 10 years? Um, but yeah, sorry, I've just thrown loads of questions at you then, but like, <laughs> what would you say to people at the moment about that? <laughs> I think the thing that I've always said is that as much as we can publish as many books as we need about, you know, about stories from different backgrounds, but I also think that the people that are doing the work and who are the editors and who are working in marketing and publicity and social media, they also need to be from diverse backgrounds because we cannot just have the stories that we have and have them worked on by people who maybe don't know as much, or maybe, you know, there was a whole conversation about sensitivity readers a while ago, and it was like, 
why do you need sensitivity readers? Why don't you just have editors um, who are from similar backgrounds who can lend their expertise to these things? Um, so it is kind of silly to have such a, a white industry and one that is going to try and, you know, give the world stories that are not from those backgrounds. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, and so I would say like the Black Writers Guild is an amazing thing. Um, and obviously they sent their letter and their demands effectively to, um, you know, to the, to the industry. And I think it's such an amazing checklist because it's like, rather than having all these workshops and all these questions and all of these like Zooms about like what we can do, it's like, okay, well actually the Black Writers Guild have given you a list of tangible things that you can achieve. And so just do them. Um, and in 10 years, things should be better, you know? Um, but I do really think, my, my main thing has always been, you know, so when I started the Fourth Estate um, and Guardian Short Story Prize, I only, I did it because I was there. And if I hadn't been there, it wouldn't have been done um, because no one in that publishing house, no one in that imprint would have understood the need for it, you know? And so I think it's about just be people of color and black people being in those spaces. Yeah, definitely. Because I think there's a lot of conversations that around, um, oh, we need to read and we need to educate ourselves. But I'm also like, but there's loads of questions we don't know we don't know. There's a the stuff that you know that you know, don't know. And there's also the stuff that you don't know how to, yeah, imagine all the different gaps and stuff that. So, yeah. Um, okay. One last question. Um, can we know if you're working on something at the moment? I saw some pictures on the internet of you. Um, <laughs> well, I can't writing your second book <laughs> but I want I want to know details can you give any yeah, I'm probably going to get in a lot of trouble I should say well actually I'm going to talk to you today no no it's fine so I had a, so I had a novel I'm basically I had a novel and then I'm editing it now and I'm like do I really love it do I really love it do I love it and so I started writing another one and I've got to talk to my editor about that but like I just um yeah so you know so it's about two things either one is about grief and, and what that does to a person and what it does to people. And that is like friends, family, um, and also about the strong friend. And then one, this one that I'm like, mm, should I do this one? Is about, um, I don't know how to explain it in the, I've never, so I haven't spoken about it really before. Um, it's uh, it's a, a man who has, who has five children with five different women. And when they're very young, he introduces them to each other and he says, this is just so um, you don't, um, this is so you, you know you don't go out with each other basically um and he's like you don't have to be friends just so you know and then they don't talk to each other because they have nothing that keeps them in common apart from this man who is like largely absent in their lives and then uh the middle child something happens and she calls her big sister the eldest and is like something has happened and then they basically all assemble to sort this thing out and through the novel they kind of figure out who they are and they kind of figure out who the other is and they figure out themselves and the relationship that they have to their dad and what their dad not being there has done to them. Um, so yeah, so there are two options basically that maybe I'll do a, should I do a vote? I'll do an online poll and see what the people I'll want. Put it to the population. That's, that's who knows best. I'm sure democracy works. <laughs> <Not by now. laughs> that's never gone wrong in the past. Never, never, never. Um, well, thank you so much for speaking to us. I hope that you're going to celebrate. Are you going to celebrate indoors? What are you going to do? Uh, so yesterday I celebrated by watching Karate Kid, the original, uh, and having a turmeric tea because I just not. I was just a bit. I don't, I'm not. I've not come from a celebration background, um, but I'm going to see my my agent today for a socially distant celebration, and I've been promised uh, pizza, and you can get me anywhere with that. So. That's what I'm gonna do. Um, but yeah, make just gonna be writing. Say that again. I said they, you've said it now, so they have to provide it. It's on the internet. People will know if there's no pizza. But yeah, mainly I'm just gonna be, be writing because um, you know I just need to do that. I need to, and this has kind of been like, my God, help! Like, there's more you have to do. You have to be better than you have to do better than Queenie somehow. But you know, it's gonna be a very different thing. That's what I keep telling myself, so I don't cry. <laughs> well whatever it is I'm very excited and I'm very excited to hopefully maybe see Queenie on the big screen as well that would be amazing on the small screen um, thank you so much and congratulations thank you